Hello and welcome to Shampoo and Booze, a podcast about Airbnb and short-term rentals at shampooandbooze.com. We are Ryan and Ashley, sisters who run Airbnbs and want to help you run yours. Every week we cover topics about the design and operation of short-term rentals. Send us your questions with an audio file or written to shampooandbooze at gmail.com and we'll do our best to cover the topics that you care about. We are also available to give design and listing advice for your Airbnb or short-term rental. Check out our services page at notperf.com to book a time with us. Hello, we are doing episode 69, and it is a Q&A episode, so we're going to do a little roundup. Uh, we've gotten mostly emails so we're going to read those. So let's get started with this first one. This is from Chloe, who looks like they are working to set up an Airbnb just outside of Paris. Wow. Uh, that sounds great. Uh, <laughs> invite us over. And the first question is, in episode 38, Ryan and Jay talked about listing their place on Craigslist and getting people interested in booking for one or two months, which you declined because you're not a long-term rental. Do you remember this episode? Yeah, I do remember. That's so long ago, but yes, I totally remember that. So her question was wondering why you would turn, out, turn down potential long-term rentals. She says, I'm imagining the house I'm working on would be ideal for professors on sabbatical or renting for a month as, you know, a nomadic workspace. So just wondering why you weren't interested in having that type of client. Right. And that's a great question. So I'm not, I'm, I am interested in people booking for an entire month, but I am also interested in them paying the full price that I have on Airbnb. So the problem with, uh, long-term rentals generally is you're not going to get the same amount of money as you would if you were renting every weekend or every other night, uh, especially in a peak season, if you have seasons where you live. In the winter time, I would love to rent for an entire month. When we were advertising on Craigslist, it was for vacation rentals. It was in our nearest big city, which is Washington, D.C., and people would advertise there for, you know, their own little rental, vacation rental businesses. Um, this is honestly, with our, it was with our first rental, and it was when Airbnb was pretty new. So we were just trying out everything. But the problem was we were getting people who were not wanting to come for vacation rentals. They were wanting to come for you know, renting for like 800 bucks a month for a whole house. And I'm like, I make so much more money on Airbnb with these houses, which we've, you know, renovated and spent, you know, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars renovating and buying. So I can't afford to rent it out to people for a month for like $800. I like long-term rentals. I think that if you have the right space for people, um, or if you're trying to do it in the off-peak season, you could negotiate with someone. But um, even in the off-peak season for us, we make enough money on the weekends or on like, you know, Valentine's Day in the middle of the week um, just to pay for things more than a long-term rental. Going to Ashley, I want to ask you, I mean, being in the city, you've kind of flip-flopped with both of those scenarios where you have your Airbnb open um, for certain times and then you get a long-term tenant for a couple months here and there just to chill out on having to clean the linens every other night and stuff and just having someone there, you know, that's more stable, right? Yeah, exactly. So having a long-term rental for me in the off season is is key. Basically, you know, because I live in a city that is much more tourist driven, it's nearly impossible to keep my Airbnb booked through the winter. So for me, I actually turn it off and then I either post on Craigslist or I ask around for friends and it's worked out really well for me so far. Um, I sort of suspect, so this person is outside of Paris, I suspect that people are much more likely to go to that area for sabbatical than, say, Boston or 
Virginia. So it might be that, you know, one of the options you can do on Airbnb is I think for a longer term rental, you can give discounts. So if someone wants to Airbnb for an entire month, your space, you could give them a 15% discount or a 10% discount. And it makes that a little bit more desirable. So that is possible um, on Airbnb. Right. I just think it depends on your situation. So you can see if people are inquiring for that long. Um, I've had writers and teachers come out for, you know, a week, a week and a half and stay, but never a full month. Um, But I think it's something to consider, especially in the winter months when maybe you're not having those high peak season prices and demand. The second half of Chloe's email asks us this. After the Airbnb is set up and running, I will not be staying in France and I'm hoping to arrange a network of people to manage my house as my family members who live near the house don't have time to manage the rental. That makes sense because it's it can be a part-time to full-time job. Um, I'm not quite sure how this would work, and I'm even considering hiring a company to manage the place. One thing I've been trying to figure out is the laundry situation. We're planning to buy a washer and a dryer for the house. I think that's a good idea. Um, Do you think it's feasible for the cleaner to take care of all the laundry? The house sleeps four people while cleaning. I'm not really sure how long an in-depth post-guest cleaning takes, and if it's enough time to wash sheets for two queen beds and four sets of towels, plus anything else. Uh, yeah, so, and we've mentioned before how we do our, our cleaners bring everything back to us. We wash it and we will give them a whole batch of clean laundry. Um, so that's kind of like a two-part question. The, the management part, um, which is a huge thing to have to figure out. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um I mean, you have to, if you're running a full year, full-time Airbnb while you're not there, you have to have someone managing it. You know, you can talk to people over the internet and manage your calendar, but you will need a handy, handy person and you will need cleaners. So you will have to hire those people and you should hire them in person uh, while you're in the country or in town um, so that you can vet them and make sure they know what you want and how you want things and they need to tell you how much it's going to cost you, et cetera, et cetera. Another option that I have not used myself, but I know uh, friends who have used this is that Airbnb links you up with people who act as hosts on your behalf. Um, And it's a little bit of a like vetting process that you go through yourself. Um, But that is another possibility. And I don't know what your area is like. I don't know if there are people in your area who are looking for that. But that's another kind of like in-app service, so to speak. The other thing you can do, you said you have family in the area, is hire a family member. I mean, you could hire them and they would take a percentage to... Schedule the cleaners, schedule the maintenance person. You're always in communication with them. I mean, depending on how busy your place is so that you have someone you trust uh, or you can hire a friend of one of your family members so that you get connected to them. I find that that's always a good thing to have like a, you know, friend of a friend or friend of a family member where you can kind of like have a recommend, not always, but you know, you can have a recommendation for them, but you will have to have those things in place before you start. Because if you start and then leave, that's going to be a little bit messy. I was going to say, so the other question uh, about laundry. So I feel like this is definitely your wheelhouse in terms of how long would it take to clean a four people rental? So I would give your cleaner, uh, I'm assuming you have, you know, two bedrooms, at least one bathroom, if not one and a half or two. And there's a kit, there's going to be a kitchen area an eating area, and maybe another common area three hours minimum uh we give three hours to our cleaners we have checkouts at noon check-ins at three and that is a tight window um the other thing too is depending on how busy your house is you might not have what we call it a flip so you're not turn you might not be turning over the house in three hours like someone's coming at three and they left at noon it might be like they're not coming for a couple days or we're only you know 
having bookings on weekends, so you're you might be fine. But the ideal is to have a flip all the time <laughs> because that means you're booked all the time. So we give our cleaners three hours. I don't know if three hours is enough to do the linens. Um, we just were not comfortable with that. Um, we also didn't have a washer dryer at our houses. So we had to create a system. We had a washer at one house, but no dryer. So that is, that is an impossible task to do the laundry. Your cleaner might be able to do it. Um, they might, depending on what your linens are, but you know, two bedrooms and towels, it might be okay, but you might just hire that person to grab all the dirty stuff, bring it with them, have the clean stuff all ready to go, clean the house. It might take them less than three hours, and then they just bring everything home and deal with it. You know, you're paying them to deal with the laundry. Basically, you have to do a trial run just to know. I mean, you could do a trial run and be like, oh, yeah, the laundry's done in an hour. It's no big deal. Although, actually, that's not true because you might have three loads of laundry. And if it's an hour each, that's three hours. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. When I hear of people doing it that way, I feel like it's an impossible task. Unless you're Ashley, who has one room. That could be possible, you know, with a one bedroom. You know, you could do a queen bed with their towels in one load. And then it's done and then it's put away. But, you know, at our houses, each house we have three bedrooms. Some some rooms have two beds. So it's like, it's an impossible task for us. So that's just something to keep in mind. Yeah, I think I agree. I feel like you're going to have to do a test run there. And then, you know, that's a matter of either training someone to do it or or having someone who's willing to figure out the the kinks with you as you work through the timing and the logistics of it. So in that way, it's like almost better to have a friend of the family or, you know, a neighborhood person, someone who's, you know, looking for this part time work, who's going to be thorough. I don't have experience with management companies, but just keep in mind that they may be more expensive in the long run than a neighborhood person. Right. So the, the thing about management companies, I mean, they're going to charge you a percentage and uh, the management company that I know that's local, they charge you a percentage of your booking and they charge you for cleaning. So it's like a double whammy. So you're better off going with someone local that you can coordinate with and train and get to know and communicate with and be able to, you know, have have a relationship with than with a company who's going to charge you more. So that's just my opinion. I don't know about your area. You might find a great management company and it's fine. And then you manage it when you're in town. But yeah, that's up to you to just do the research. Okay, so we got another batch of questions from Rob. And Rob is about to start a short-term rental on a beautifully renovated home in New England. And he had a bunch of questions. So he had many, many questions. So we're not going to answer all of them. And we would strongly advise that you hire us for design <laughs> and listing advice to answer yes. all of your questions. And I would Yay. say that to everyone. Um, but we're going to address some of his questions that we thought um, would help a lot of people. So one of his first questions is, how early should we go live with the listing before it is ready to be inhabited? In other words, should we list the house a month before we start renting it out or don't go live with the listing until the day that people can actually stay there? Okay. That's a good question because they're actually for all of our rentals, all three at this point, um, we knew that the house was done, it was clean, and it was basically ready for people to stay in, but we were either going away for a work trip right before it, or we knew we had to do like a little bit of maintenance, you know, just like a couple things had to get done, but the photographs were done, like the listing was done. So yeah, like we've had like our most recent rental, we um, were gone for part of August, but I took photos right before uh, we left. Like we staged the apartment and we took photos and we wrote the listing and we were like, we want to get this online so people can start renting it for, it was for Labor Day weekend, which we were going to be home a couple days before that. That's what we did. 
Um, basically, we had the listing up. I think the listing was live the first week of August, and we made it available for like, I think it was August 31st um, for like Labor Day weekend and beyond. It was like, now this is ready. So I don't think it's a bad thing to do that where you're like, I have a little bit of time where things need to be done, but the the issue, the timing is with taking your photos and writing your listing. So the house has to be like photo ready before you write the listing and get it online and start advertising it, you know, so you have to kind of keep those things in mind. I And I was going to say, so Rob sent us a picture of um, the house and it's beautiful and it looks very large and staging that house for pictures is going to be you know, a serious event. And so to get to that point is going to be a lot of work, obviously. So I totally agree. I feel like your house basically has to be completely ready for you to take pictures. And if you want it to be accurate, like we see Airbnb pictures all the time where we can tell they're like actually kind of still working on the house or it feels a little bit not finished yet. And I highly, <laughs> highly recommend not doing that. So, yeah, I agree. I think the other thing, too, is you save yourself from doing it twice because I've I when we were doing the apartment, we were thinking, oh, we'll take some preliminary photos. I even have to redo some of my photos because we like changed a chair and like the front of our building wasn't a hundred percent painted, but now it is. So I'm like, I have to redo like half the photos, which is okay because they're okay for now on the listing, but I'm doing my job twice now. And you, it's okay to do that because you can fill in here and there and you do want to do that when you update things, but you don't want to have to do the whole house again. It's like, Honestly, it's exhausting. So you're like, plus all the other things you have to do. You're running an Airbnb. You probably have another full-time job. You might even have another part-time job like the rest of us. So <laughs> you're like, as efficient as you can be with your listing is what you want to do. And the other thing that people don't think about is when you start renting, the moment you press go on your rental, unless you uh, block out dates you do not have time to restage and re-photograph your house unless you say in three months we're blocking out five days to do this or what you know however much you need to rearrange something, hire a photographer or get an Airbnb photographer or do it yourself. But basically, once you press go, do not uh, do not anticipate much time between rentals, especially if you're getting ready for a peak season. So really, as much as you can do before the rental goes live is is much kinder on yourself. Yeah, I totally could not agree more. I mean, sometimes I know this with you, Ryan, sometimes like I know you have an hour window to go like fix a plumbing issue, you know, so it's like you 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 have no idea. It's like there just isn't really time. And especially if you're not there on the ground. So if you're managing this from afar, then that makes it even harder. Right. And the ideal is that you don't have time to do any of that stuff because you are so booked. Like we were having a little issue with one of our um, air conditioning unit drains at one of the houses and we literally could not find a second to go over there. So we had to go over there when the renters got there. We were like, we just have to fix this thing. We know you just got there. Like, tell us when you're out hiking and we'll come by and check it out. We're not even going to go in the house. It's outside the house, you know, but... In a way, that's annoying. You're like, we don't even have a second. Like, the people are always there. But that's a luxury problem. You want that problem, basically, because that means you're rented all the time. So another question from Rob is, in prior episodes, you mentioned that you do not allow weddings on your property. We would like to allow a few events per year for an additional fee. He said that him and his wife were married on the property as were many of their relatives and they would love to hear your reasons for not allowing at least a limited number of events on your property. So I think it depends on the property. Um, if you have space for lots of people 
uh, Rob sent us a photo of an event. It was like a family party, and I think it was about 60 people. Looks like there was plenty of room for people on the back deck. There's like a huge deck. Looks like a big yard. Looks like there's a there could be a lot of parking. Um, we just did the numbers on what our house could handle. Now, this is for one of our houses. Our other houses, there's one's an apartment, so that's impossible. The other one is like, it used to be a cabin. I would consider it more of a house now. <laughs> it's bigger. But there's no parking. There's parking for three cars, tops. Cannot park any more than that. And there's a deck that can hold like six to eight people max at our other house. The first house we renovated is a farmhouse. It's got almost two acres. So that was the house we were kind of considering doing like elopements, basically, like 20 people. But the problem was we have a it's the house was built in the 1850s. We have a sep septic system from the 1970s. The septic system's fine. It's not failing. Um, we get it pumped like every two years, which is probably overkill. But we just got worried about the we have a we have a well. And, you know, we were worried about water usage, bathroom usage. Where are people going to park? If people say there are, you know, 30 people max, well, what if they double it and they don't tell us? My neighbors are not going to be happy. Like, we have neighbors pretty close by. Do they want to put a tent up if there's a wedding outside? Like, will our yard be able to handle that? Will they be able to handle trash? Like, I have several friends in our area who are wedding planners and own wedding venues. And we kind of talked with them about the, you know, like, do we need to supply chairs? Do we need to supply porta potties? Like, it got to this point where we were like, we just don't want to think about it. Plus, people wanted to pay a lot less for an event. People still message us all the time. Oh, can we have a wedding here? And we just want to pay the weekend rate. Like, we want to pay for a house and have a wedding there. And we're like, no, you can't. Like, that's why there are wedding. That's why a wedding venue costs minimum $5,000 because they have to deal with all those logistics. You know, our house is, you know, on the weekends in peak season, you know, a few hundred dollars a night. And they're like, we just want to pay $500 for our wedding. And you're like, yeah, no. <laughs> so that's for us, for our property, we have allowed people having like, um, a, a dinner like the next day or a rehearsal dinner. We had one couple have a rehearsal dinner and actually we decided not to do it anymore because those people, even after they, they booked a year in advance and it was Memorial Day weekend, not to get in the weeds here, it was Memorial Day weekend, which is like the beginning of our peak season. Memorial Day weekend will always get booked and it will get booked for a lot of money. And they booked a year in advance and wanted to cut their reservation in half because they were getting closer to their wedding and they were spending all their money and they were nervous about it. And we were like, we allowed this to happen because you booked a year in advance and you booked all, I think they booked five nights. And we were like, that's why we allowed it because we were like getting a good price for that weekend and you promised it would be cool. And then they tried to like go back on their reservation. And <laughs> basically what we said was we were like, we will easily rebook this so we can cancel the entire reservation. This is like two weeks before. <laughs> and they were like, I remember that. I remember it was two weeks before their reservation and they wanted to cut it in half. I remember that exact scenario. And we just were like, well, we can rent it out to someone else probably just fine. So we're happy to cancel it. And they were like, no, you know, they had family coming from England and like, you know, whatever. You're like, you really want to do this now? So just the whole hassle of having to deal with that, you're dealing with brides and grooms and family that have over, you know, are over budget. They're stressed out. They're traveling. They have a million people traveling. And it just was not something we wanted to deal with. We're like, we're not a venue. We love it if people stay here during their wedding weekend or their honeymoon or their like the bridesmaids are getting ready all in one house weekend, not having the wedding here, not even an elopement, nothing. Unless you're getting you're eloping and it's literally you and your parents like fine. <laughs> but we even ask people. To, so, you know, it's just all the logistics that you deal with. And if you do want to have an event, you know, 
people getting married, whatever. If you want to allow that, just work it out beforehand. You have to have a set of rules and a set of expectations that you lay out in writing and have them say yes to it ahead of time. Yep, that's what I was going to say is like, have the boundaries be in writing, be very clear, you know, what are your fees for? What aren't your fees for? What's allowed? What's not allowed? You know, it's definitely like, when Ryan says that her and Jay did the numbers, it's like, you know, is the extra fee that you would be charging to have, you know, X amount of people and all of the wear and tear on your property worth all of the logistics. And the one thing I'm concerned about is that you're managing this property from afar. So the fact that you're not just a, you know, 10 mile drive or even an hour drive away um, makes me think that you allowing, you know, a wedding here and there means you need to be on site for it, or you need to be off site close by. Um, and you're obviously familiar with your property. You've but you were married there, obviously. Your family has, so you're familiar with it enough to know what its quirks are. If you have someone managing your property from afar, or you know you have somebody close by, it's like can they handle that level of logistics? And again, is it worth? the extra amount of money that you'd be getting for that property. Right. And something to keep in mind as well is like, if something goes wrong and like the hot water's not working right before the wet, like that is going to be a huge problem. You know, just on regular rentals, that's a problem. Like people want hot water and the oven needs to work. And like, but on a wedding, like times 10, you know, the level of stress for everyone is like way up there. And you, like Ashley said, you need to be on site or you need to have a maintenance person who is on site or on call. So, it, you know, it was things like that where I was like, <laughs> it's not worth the extra time and money. Like I would rather just like do regular rentals and push my, uh, you know, people who want to have weddings to our, all the wedding venues in our area because they're awesome and they're super affordable compared to the city. So that's what we try to do. So the last question that kind of ties into this is because you're going to be remote hosts, you said, uh, we live in New York, so we'll be remote hosts, but with plenty of eyes on the property. I assume you mean there are like family members in the area. Um, I know both of you are currently remote hosts. What steps have you taken to prevent unauthorized Airbnb parties from occurring? I am not, well, I'm remote in that I don't live on my properties, but I do not consider myself a remote host. Like if someone has a problem, I will drive to the house I will drop everything and drive to the house because I can. Ashley is sort of remote right now, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I feel like I've always had a personal rapport with people who are coming in. So it's kind of like if I'm not there on site when someone arrives, I'm very hands-on. I'm like, great, okay, how many of you are there? Just making sure there are only two or you know, just like double checking all those details so that they don't get the sense that I'm just some like rando anonymous person. Um, and also so they know that they can check in with me if they need something. I've definitely had people ask if they could have people like over to the house for dinner. And I sort of feel like that's great. It's like they respect me and my space enough to be like hey we were gonna have like some people over for dinner like is that cool you know and I'm like absolutely are they gonna sleep over <laughs> you right. know I don't ask that but it's sort of like you know the fact that they ask I feel like is a good sign you know but I think what's tricky about your property is it's clearly like a party venue well so I mean what we do is we lay it out in our rules we say, I mean, you're like, so what? Uh, but we say, we don't want more than X amount of people, it depends on the property, you know, like eight people at the property any one time without, without prior permission. And I feel the way that we prevent parties is people know we live right down the street. And I say in our rule book, and I think on our listing, you can put your like rule book on your listing too. 
I'm like, no parties, no loud noise, because we have neighbors and they will call the cops if you're being loud. Like, that will happen. Um, so I try to lay that out. And, you know, there are times where <laughs> our cleaners will bring the trash and the recycling back. And I'm like, this looks like more than four people were there. <laughs> like, there's a lot of wine and beer and booze that got drank in like two nights, you know. <laughs> Maybe they're heavy drinkers. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, we just try to prevent it ahead of time. Like we just say, if you're going to have a dinner party, because we've had it where people are like, oh, we're, you know, our friends are renting a cabin down the street and we're going to have them over for a barbecue. Is that cool? Again, they ask. And we ask that they tell us and that they ask, you know. So it's it's like we said before, you're setting up those expectations where if you are having events um, you're saying, how many people are going to be there? Is this a 100-person wedding? Is this a 30-person wedding? We need to know. You just need to know. Although it is tough that you are thinking of allowing events and parties and weddings and then trying to prevent unauthorized ones from occurring because your house and your property is big enough to handle that. So I don't know. It's it's all about making expectations. And maybe if you're not there, I mean, you'll have someone check people in or have someone check in. Hey, my maintenance person is going to come by. Hey, my, you know, so and so relative is going to check in on you guys and see if you need anything, you know, so that they're like, there are people around like we might not be there, but like you said, eyes on the property <laughs> is a good thing. That's a really good point. Like maybe the check-in process is in person. Um, I think what's really tricky about that, and Ryan and I both have like nightmare stories about this, but someone says, we'll be there at three and three turns into midnight. And so it's very challenging to do in-person check-in, but maybe what you're saying, Ryan, is like they check in, but the next day the expectation is that somebody comes by to just like check on everything. You know, how to do that without being heavy handed, I don't know, but. Well, the other thing that we do is you can say that you're going to meet them to show them around. And then as the time, so that you're setting that expectation, we're going to let you in. Uh, So-and-so, my, you know, relative or general maintenance person is going to uh, check you in. So they have it in their heads, oh, I can't bring 100 people, like 100 people can't show up at check-in. So they, you know, you're setting that expectation. And then as time gets closer, if you are around, you could check them in. Um, but like Ashley said, there have been so many times in the first year that we did Airbnb that we're like, okay, they said they'd be here at three and we're just sitting here waiting. So that's not really going to work for your life uh, or anyone's life. So then you're like, okay, great. Here's the door code. Just check in and let me know if you need anything. So you've already set the expectation. And then the next day you're like, you know, the day before they come, you're like, okay, just check yourself in and we'll be by or we might not or whatever. <laughs> you know, there's ways to make it seem like that's going to happen and it could happen. But if it doesn't, you're like, here's the door code, you know? Okay, I hope that that was helpful. We love getting your questions and we love attempting to answer them. Okay, bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to Shampoo and Booze at shampooandbooze.com. As usual, send us your questions with an audio file or written to shampooandbooze at gmail.com and we'll do our best to cover the topics you care about. Don't forget about our design and listing advice services. Head over to our services page at notperf.com to book your design advice session.